Uh, so glad you guys are here. Uh, so it was about 15 years ago, uh, so 2008, uh, circa around there, uh, I was uh, hosting a panel discussion on extreme poverty in the city of Albany, uh, and we were looking for a location to do it, and we did it at the Madison Theater, so just down the road here. And uh, this is uh, important for where I'm going to go with the story. Uh, the Madison Theater has been uh, bought and sold, uh, I believe, at least three times since uh, the story I'm about to tell. And uh, one of the owners especially, uh, they kind of ripped all the old seats out and all the old carpet, and they like, put in a bunch of new stuff, and it's like legitimately like a pretty nice place now. So go and like patronize it. It's like really, really great. Uh, but in 2008, some of you have been in the neighborhood uh, in those times, uh, the Madison Theater was like a little bit iffy. <laughs> uh, and like it was like, uh, even when you went to go see a movie, like it felt a little bit dirty, felt a little, you know, but like when you walked in, like, there was always, like, a few lights burn out. And so, like, even in the lobby, it was, like, dark. And so, like, you knew it wasn't great, but, like, you couldn't really see much. And then like, you went in the theater, and all the lights were out. And just, you know, the, the lights were on for the projector. So you really couldn't see all that much. But for this panel we were going to do, uh, we wanted to be able to see the audience. And so we're like, okay, let's, like, turn on every light in the theater. And let me tell you, you can't unsee some stuff. Uh, uh, there was just, like, like... Every seat, you know, there was like, you know, like some like were hanging off the hinges and like the upholstery was torn and you looked in between the seats and there was like melted candy and popcorn from like two decades ago and like quite a few spots when you walked, you had that like, you know, feeling you know, on your shoe and just soda that had spilled at some point and it was just like so gross. We're like, what are we going to do? Like, should we like keep going, and, like, you know, or should we, maybe we should, like, you know, we want to see people, but I don't know if we want to see everything that we're seeing right now, so maybe we should keep it a little bit dimmer, because that's what light does. Light kind of shows everything that's there and reveals what's actually going on, uh, or uh, I had a friend uh, when I was in college. It was actually the church I uh, worked at, and uh, his job, uh, he worked for a company that would, like, do uh, uh, cleanings in restaurants and things like that. And so his job, he's a salesman, he had to go around and try to show people, here's like why you need our services. And so he would walk into a restaurant and it would overall, you know, usually look, you know, fairly clean, but he had the special UV light that he would like put on the counters and he like put on the dishes and it would reveal like whatever microscopic bacteria, you know, stuff was going on there. And so he used to, he would make a list for those of us who knew him. He was like, here's the restaurant you should go to. Here's the restaurant you should avoid because I have seen, I have been there with my little magical light and you might not see it when you go in, but I, it's been revealed to me what's actually going on there and you might want to stay clear. Because again, that's what light does. White just shows everything that's going on and reveals what's going on below the surface. And so, as we come into Christmas time and we use phrases like, Jesus is the light of the world, what exactly does that mean? If white is something that reveals and shows what's going on, what does that mean for it to be good news that light has come into the world, so now all of a sudden we can really see what's been going on the whole time in our world and in us? Uh, here's what it says in uh, John uh, chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, uh, as in Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Uh, what we believe, if you're a new visiting Christ Church Albany, is we believe that Jesus is God. And we believe that Jesus is the Word of God. So the Word of God is not a book. The Word of God is a person. And that person was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. We celebrate that Jesus came at Christmas, but what we believe is that Jesus has been around since the beginning. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him 
was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has no ability to overcome it and hide anymore what the light is now revealing. Uh, or here's a verse maybe you've heard before. This is uh, later on in the same uh, book that a guy named John wrote 2,000 years ago. This is in John uh, chapter 3. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Uh, we're just going to put around here. We say that eternal life is not just something that is someday, but eternal life is something right now. It's an abundant, full life that we have been invited to experience starting right this instant. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We believe that the idea of belief is not a matter of force. It's a matter of decision, of choice. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light on purpose, their own decision, so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and has been done in the sight of God. Uh, if you've uh, been hanging out with us for a little bit, uh, going back to September, we've been looking at the first couple pages of the Bible. Uh, and the reason why we've been looking at these, uh, we have said that when we're looking at those pages, uh, that we're not trying to read them through a historical lens. We're not necessarily trying to find exactly what happened or didn't happen thousands of years ago. Uh, we're not trying to read it through a scientific lens. So we're not trying to figure out exactly scientifically what was going on. We're trying to read it through a theological lens. Because what we believe is the first couple pages of the Bible show us something about who God is and what really the whole story of the Bible is about. And what we have said that what is going on in those first couple pages is we see that God had a plan for how he created this world. Uh, and here was God's plan for how he created the whole world. As first, uh, we have said that God created a world that was very good, but that it wanted to get bigger, that it wanted to expand, that God didn't just create this like sterile world that was kind of perfect in the snow globe, you know, don't mess with it, but that God created this world that was packed with all this potential that would then grow. And so here's, you know, this garden and here's these people and here's these animals, but it's not just supposed to stay in this little garden. It's supposed to grow. And so the more plants and more people and civilizations and cultures and ingenuity and science and arts and culture and just all this amazingness that God wanted the world to expand to be. And God created this like little garden of potential that was hoping that over years and decades and centuries that it would just grow and grow and grow and expand. And God's big plan of how he wanted this world to expand was not just him doing it, but he intentionally created people made in the image of God with the thought that we were going to partner along with him, uh, that God's going to be the king, but we get to rule and reign with him, uh, that we get to be priests in this big cosmic temple, that we have such a big Role. Our identity is based in this big idea of all this potential that God wants us to do and that we get to work and we just get to like be a part of these amazing world-changing endeavors, uh, that we get to delight and rest, and that we get to do it all together, that we're like a part of this team, we're a part of this family, we're a part of this congregation. Uh, and what we've said over and over over the last couple months is that this whole idea that God had for this potential of the world is what we call flourishing. 
that that's what a flourishing world looks like. That's what it looks like for you in your life to just be like, this is why I was made. It's when I'm a part of making the world expand, when I'm making the world a better place, when I'm partnering with God, when I'm not alone, when I have other people. That's what a flourishing world looks like. Uh, And as I've been thinking about that over the last couple weeks, uh, is they're getting ready for Christmas. There's kind of this analogy or a metaphor that kind of keeps coming uh, to me. Uh, and what keeps coming to me is this idea of Christmas. Uh, and what I think about is, for me especially, uh, when it comes to Christmas time, I have like such a plan. Uh, you know, I have, you know, think about church and community and all that kind of stuff, but for this analogy, I'm thinking mostly about my little family. And so Ashley and I and our two kids, when it comes to like Christmas time, I have such like a hope and a plan of what this season will be like because I love Christmas and I just have all this like hope of like what is going to happen over this month. Uh, and so some of the things that we do over Christmas, we have a handful of Christmas experiences uh, that we are just kind of, Heather talked about traditions. These are like just some traditions that are just so important in our family. And so, of course, uh, the tree, and for us, a uh, tree is kind of this big deal. And so uh, we go cut down a tree uh, because we're Christians, and that's what Christians do. And uh, just kidding, I love you artificial people. Uh, but it's kind of this whole deal where it's the, the two days after Thanksgiving, and we all load up in the truck, and we put Christmas music on, and we drive out to this farm that we love, and we cut down the tree, and we just try to have this, like, whole experience. We take it back to the house, and we decorate it, and we have all these decorations that, you know, each one kind of tells a specific story, and it's just this amazing experience of this kind of tree that we have, and it sits in our living room, obviously, and we sit around it as much as we can and enjoy it, and it's such an important part of our Christmas. Uh, Food is obviously a huge deal. Um, uh, We're eggnog people, again, because we're Christians, and and there's like all these, like, Special foods that are just so special to our family. We make you know, spe- Christmas cookies, and uh, there's this pumpkin roll with an eggnog sauce uh, that uh, my mom made when I was a kid, and now I make it uh, every Christmas. And there's this, all these things that like, it's, it tastes like Christmas, and they're just so special to us. Uh, family and travel is so much a part of our Christmas. Uh, we live about a thousand miles away from uh, where most of our family lives. Most of them live out in the Midwest. Uh, we've lived here in Albany for uh, over 20 years now, so this is home for us, but uh, family lives a long ways away. Uh, but we travel, or our family travels, almost every holiday season. And so there really hasn't been a, a holiday where a part of our holiday experience isn't like loading up and flying on a plane somewhere or getting in the car and doing the long drive back to Illinois. Uh, and that's just a part of what we do. And then we spend time with family. Uh, and then I've talked about it, um, but I would say Advent is kind of the season of Advent. Uh, but I'm talking specifically Uh, On the season of Advent, on the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, uh, we just have a tradition in our family that every Sunday night uh, after dinner, we try to get get things kind of settled down in the house, and we turn turn off every light in the house, and uh, my daughter's in the habit of lighting every candle around, uh, and we put on special music, and we kind of have this special time around the tree, and we share these stories, and we have these different activities that we do, and they're just so special to us. Uh, But here's the deal in all of these experiences. These are all incredibly important to me, uh, and now I'm trying to help my family for for it to be very important to them too. But it's not just about these experiences. It's I have this like hope that by doing these experiences that it will like create something inside my family. Because these are really all based around these values uh, that we have, as a, that I have, and that I want to be a part of our family. Uh, and these are some that, I mean, a lot of you share as well. And these are a little cliche, but they're special to me, so don't laugh. Uh, so it would be the idea of giving is better than getting. It's just like a huge deal. I just, I just want my family, I want myself to be the spirit of generosity. I don't want it to be just all month long, what am I going to get? You know, let me make my big list. I want them to have, like, uh, getting stuff is good. 
but just to have this big feeling of like, man, I can't wait until I get to give the gift that I've been working on. Uh, or one of the things that we do in our family, that many of you do in yours, is we give money all year long, uh, but especially at Christmas, we'll try to give some sort of a bigger year-end gift, uh, and in the nicest way possible, we try to let my kids know that we give away way more money than we spend on their gifts, uh, because it's just this value in our faith, like, it, getting the gifts is good, but like, giving is uh, so much better, uh, the idea that presence is better than presence, so again, like, the gifts are fine, but so much of what we want the holidays to be is the special time together. And so, I mean, so many of these, like, going to get the tree and making food together and having this time of Advent, it's all about, like, creating this, these moments where we can just, like, be together. Uh, and especially my wife, Ashley, has been wonderful about, like, trying to simplify Christmas over the last little bit. It's a big talk for a lot of folks because Christmas can just be so crazy and hectic and you're running around and stressful and like, you're doing all this work to get ready for Christmas, but you're not actually spending time with the people that you love so much. And so it's just such a value in, in our house and our family that we want to have special time with each other. You know, we don't just want to be, you know, sitting there, you know, bored or watching TV or, you know, just on our phones, all not really with each other. We want to have moments with each other. Uh, and it's, the idea that family is worth the effort. I mean, so much of, th this is hard, as some of you guys know. And the, the travel and the time and the money and uh, our families, like your family, where we just have, you know, stuff in the past and, you know, there's been arguments and you, you got to make up with people and there's times we've had to go to counselors and it's just like all, but we really want our kids to see and for us, it's this value in our house that, like, family is Difficult as it might be sometimes, it's worth the effort. It's worth saying sorry. It's worth the drive. It's worth the money. It's just like so important to us. Uh, and then uh, the idea is that Jesus is the reason for the season, that we just want them to know, like, uh, on top of all the other, like, trimmings that can go along with Christmas, that the reason why we're doing all this stuff is just that we believe Jesus is just the center of all of life, and we just want to make everything about that, and these are just so, so important. And so as we're doing these things, like I have this like just hope that like each of these moments that we're doing, it, that it's not just about going to get the tree. It's not just about going and making cookies, but each of those moments is like packed with this like little potential where hopefully as we're going along, that it's like growing something in myself and it's growing something in our kids, uh, that, you know, as they're helping to make presents, you know, Ashley's got these crafts that, you know, they make and they give away, that, like, something in them is, like, being changed and formed, where they just believe that generosity is the best way to live, and I even have this hope that it's going to grow and grow and grow, and so as, like, they get older, that it's not us, like, having to, like, even help them even know these things, but they're just, like, producing them on themselves. You know, they're just, like, showing up with these ideas of ways that they can do this because it's not something we're telling them to do. It's something that's just who they are becoming. Uh, and I even have, like, dumb dreams of, you know, someday, you know, our kids are grown up and, you know, and they're, you know, maybe they're in college or, they, you know, they're out on their own and, you know, they're with their roommates or they're with their partner or family, whatever that looks like for them someday. And, you know, Ashley and I are, you know, it's just the two of us and we're in our house and we're doing Advent and then our kids are sending us pictures and like, hey, here's me and my roommates and, and we're doing it too. Because this isn't just something that, like, you, like, made us do when we were kids, this is something that has, like, become who we are, and it started as this thing, but now it's, like, expanding and moving and just growing to who they are. Uh, and my hope is, is that all these things just happen, and it's not something that, like, my kids are their own little human beings, and so I, I want it to be free, I want it to be their own free will. I want this to be, I don't want to have to, like, yell like, all right, kids, it's time to go get the tree, and you're going to like it, and you know, we're going to sit down, we're going to do Advent, drink eggnog, I don't care if you don't, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be this, like, forced thing, I want it to be where, like, they're choosing it for themselves, and they want it. Uh, now, what you all know, if you have kids, if you've been a kid, if you've been around kids, all of these hopes are just, like, ripe with potential for just blowing up and being terrible. 
Uh, and so there's so much that can go wrong, you know. Uh, and so last week, uh, one of our Advent activities, uh, we were supposed to talk about the, the, the nativity scene, and we're trying to, you know, what did it look like? What did it smell like? And so we have a tradition that we draw pictures of what it looks like. And so, like, this didn't happen, but, like, what, what if one of my kids, you know, where I all drawing these pictures, I'm like, oh, it's going to be this magical moment, and everyone shows their picture, and they're supposed to tell about it. And what if my kids held up their picture, and it just was written, Dad, this is lame. <laughs> well, what are we doing here? You know, this is like, uh, or what if you would talk about the idea of, like, giving, and uh, our kids in our uh, ministry have been collecting money in jars, and so uh, my, my daughter went out yesterday and was raising money in the neighborhood, and so like, what if, you know, she had all this money in her jar, she's like, hey, like, no one's going to know, like, I could take half this money out, I could put it in my pocket, and I could do whatever I want with this money now, I, I don't have to give this all, I, I think some getting, <laughs> some stuff for me would actually be pretty good in this. Or, or they start looking out on other people's doorsteps, and they see Amazon packages showing up, and they're like, oh, I bet maybe I could take that. And then just, they just go on through life, high school, college, adults. Uh, I don't want to drill too deep, but some of you know like, this is part of the, the difficulty of Christmas for some of us, is that as People have their own free will to kind of do whatever they want. There's all this ripe with potential, that this hope that we had of what Christmas could be, and we're just hoping that as we do these activities with our kids, that it's going to become that someday. And our kids have their own potential just to decide that they want to do whatever they want to do. And the question is, like, what do you do with that? If... If somehow, like, all this dream and hope that I had of what Christmas could be, what it could, you know, expand to be someday, if the whole thing just got blown up and fell apart and my kids decided that they wanted to live kind of a completely different way, what do I do with that? Uh, or let's back up from the analogy a little bit now. And so as God is looking at our world, what we've talked about is that God wants a world of, uh, you can go to the next one, uh, there it is, that God wants this world of flourishing. And part of the whole idea is that God has given us these instructions, this path, this plan, uh, even rules to some degree, where God has said, here's what I think is going to be a flourishing life. Here's what I think is the best way for you to live out your humanity. But the choice that we all have is that like, there's like all, all these other options of like, Others say, that I think this is going to be a more flourishing life. Like, giving money away, that's fine. But, like, wouldn't you love to have, like, more? And just, that's the accumulation of stuff. That's really where human flourishing is, you know. Interdependence, I mean, do you really want to be, like, needy on other people when you're asking other people for help? Like, is that really flourishing? Like, individuality, you know, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's where the real flourishing is. And over and over again, I mean, this is all of our stories. This is the story of humanity. Is God leading us to this idea of what flourishing can be and us going kind of the complete other way and saying, you know what, I think that there's another way to flourish and it really has no it's nothing to do with your plan. And what do you do with that? Well, what does God do with that? If you're a parent and your kids make those decisions, what do you do with that? Uh, and there's a couple different options, I guess. Uh, so for what, what I could do or what God could do is, one, I could, I could keep relationship with my kids, but just kind of ditch the plan. And so, yeah, I, I wanted to, like, have Christmas be this wonderful thing. It's going to be about generosity. And it's going to be about Jesus. And it's going to be about presence. But, like, you guys obviously don't want that, and so that's fine. I'll just, like, hang out with you guys, but, like, I don't know. I guess we'll, yeah, we'll all just sit there on, on our phones, and we'll, you know, talk about how much money we're going to spend. And, you know, I, I, I guess that's, like, I'll, I'll just give up on all these hopes I had of what our family could do. But is that, is that really? An, I mean, I, I love my kids, but this plan is, like, so I really believe it's the best way to live. Or I could keep the plan and say, no, this is how we're doing Christmas in the Hintrick household. And if you guys don't want to do it, that's fine. You guys can leave. 
and uh, well, Ash and I will just do it by herself, or I'll do it by myself, or I'll go find some other kids. And like, hey, when you guys decide that you want to come and do Christmas my way, then you can come back. But until then, you just kind of like stay away from me. And what I want us to know as we go into this Christmas season is that neither of these options are okay for God. That God just loves us way too much. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about last week, if you were here, uh, was this idea of uh, that sin has lots of consequences. That when we choose, that we are going to go against the way of God. When we choose on purpose, that we are going to, I, I see what you're saying, God, as far as flourishing, but I intentionally want to go another way. That has lots of different consequences to it. If you choose to live, live a greedy life, it has consequences. If you choose to live a lustful life, if you choose to be an individual and I'm not going to need anybody else's help, there is consequences to that. But one of those consequences is not God separating himself from you. And over and over and over again in the Bible, we did examples last week of just that God goes out of his way to say, I still want to spend time with you. I'm still going to keep showing up. I'm still going to keep talking, even if you ignore me, even if you're doing things that I don't like, even if you're doing things that I don't agree with, I am just going to keep following you around because I just love you. You can ignore me all you want. I am just going to stay there. God is going to be there. But of course, we can ignore God. And when we do, there's consequences to that. And God is not going to separate himself, but God is also not okay with the consequences. Um, I love this uh, quote. I think this is the next one. Yep, go to the next one. There you go, uh, by Max Lucado. Uh, it says, God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be like Jesus. God loves you, no matter what choices you made in your life. If, back to my analogy, if, if my kids decide that they want to go and create their own kind of very different Christmas things with very different values and very different, I'm still going to love them. But if they choose just to live like a completely non-generous life, if they choose to live a life where it's, you know, it's, it's all about pr presence, gifts, and not about actually time with people, if they choose to live, I'm going to keep wanting to have a conversation with them because I love them, and I'm not okay with the consequences that they might get. I want them to be like Jesus. Uh, and so what might happen at some point is if they're continuing to want to live in a different way than what I really hope for them to live, I'm going to love them. But there might be uh, what's called an intervention. Uh, and so I don't know if you've ever been a part. I was going to have people raise their hands, but that might be awkward. I don't know if you've ever been a part of an intervention before. Uh, I think all of you have. I'm going to explain that in a second. Uh, but here's oftentimes what we think of when we think of an intervention. Is it's when someone is choosing to live in a certain way. It often has to do with substance abuse, but it can be other things where they're choosing to live in a way that is like obviously destructive to that person. It has serious consequences. But the people around them have made a conscious decision that even though this way that they've chosen to live is destructive, we are not going to cut ourselves off from this person. We are going to continue to be in relationship with this person, but we're not going to allow them just to keep doing things that are not the best thing for them. And so we are going to choose to have a hard conversation. We're going to choose to still be in relationship with you, and we're going to choose to love you enough to address these difficult things in your life. Uh, and so maybe you've been a part of an intervention like that before. If you haven't been a part of an intervention like that before, then I bet you've at least been a part of an intervention that looks like this. That's a crazy pixelated picture. So that is uh, someone at a dentist office. Uh, so when I was in my mid-20s, uh, I had a dentist appointment, and I'd put off going to the dentist for a lot of years. 
And when you go to a dentist, it's like this exciting thing where they'll shine lights on you and they give you x-rays and they really, they're going to go out of their way to show you every single thing that's been going on. Uh, And at that point in my mid-20s, they had this conversation as they'd been putting this light on my face and showing me everything in my mouth and doing all the x-rays. said, hey, we've taken a close look at what's going on and there's there's some issues. Uh, it's obvious, like, we, you know, you were told at some point you were supposed to floss every day. It's obviously that you didn't. Uh, you were supposed to brush. Uh, it's obviously uh, there was a few times in college where you, like, fell asleep with pizza in your mouth or whatever. Like, it, it's obvious, like, you didn't do what you were told to do. But we've seen everything that's going on, and now we want to help you to get better. And that's kind of like the whole difference in an intervention uh, is in an intervention where someone's coming and just wants to show you everything that's wrong and it's like to humiliate you or to make you look bad or feel bad like that's that's not helpful at all but for someone to shine a light on your life and you know that that person loves you and that they want to help you get better that changes everything So again, here's what it says in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, flourishing life. The plan that God had always wanted us to live, Jesus came So that that could still be true. God never gave up on his plan. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. It's a choice that's still being put out to us. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But the people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Some people will never want to have the tough conversation. Some people will put off going to the dentist their whole life. Some people are so fearful to stand in front of a holy God because there's this fear that it's going to reveal all of this stuff. But whoever lives by the truth, I know I have stuff in my life I want to know, comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. God's whole plan that he's been working on this whole time is that God created this amazing, flourishing way that he wanted all of us to live. And we have all chosen that we want to live different ways. We have chosen other ways of flourishing. And he has over and over and over again invited us back and say, you can still live that life. It can still be true of you. Uh, I want to read a uh, section uh, of a book. Uh, This uh, book is called uh, Eternity is Now in Session uh, by a guy named John Orberg. Uh, This is uh, actually one of our uh, resources that we're recommending for our next series that we're going to start in January. Uh, So starting in January, we're going to be looking at this whole idea of that Jesus came to help us get back to that flourishing life that he's wanted for all of us and for the entire world. Uh, I just highly recommend this book. I want to read a a section uh, for you. said, Jesus' good news, his gospel, is simply this. The kingdom, of God has, the kingdom of God has now, through Jesus, 
become available for ordinary humans to live in. There's some people that teach that the only real reason that Jesus came to earth was to die on the cross. But death on the cross was only part of his mission, an important part, but part. His overall mission was to be the kingdom bringer. His one gospel was the gospel of the availability of the kingdom. His one purpose was to model the reality of that kingdom in his life, death, and resurrection. His one command was to pursue the kingdom. His one plan was for his people to extend the kingdom. So, what's the kingdom? It is the sphere in which everything that happens meets with God's approval and delight, the way he always wanted it to be. Everything is precisely as God wants it to be. Where the greatest humble themselves like little children, there are no big shots, no arrogant egos, no one ever has an anxious thought. Every encounter between people causes them to walk away with more joy than before, than before they met. As the Apostle Paul says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Watching over this whole realm as his greatest servant and most joyful caretaker is the magnificent God, the Father of Jesus, who is endlessly celebrated for his infinite, self-giving love. This, Jesus said, is the kingdom of God. It exists right now. People you know and love who trusted God and have died and gone before us are immersed in this reality right now. Then, there's the kingdom of the earth. How's that going? Violence, betrayal, thousands of babies dying daily due to malnutrition, women being sexually assaulted or marginalized or objectified by men, people killing others in the name of religion, God's creation getting polluted, vows of fidelity being broken, radical injustice uh, constantly smoldering and often exploding, culture wars, the pol politicization of almost everything, cynicism and fear and depression and isolation. Who does it look like is running the show here? Things in the kingdom of earth are not going well. There's not much good news for the poor or the weak or the old or the plain or the uneducated or the vulnerable. But Jesus has a plan. He described it in the world's most famous prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, here's my plan. I'm going to bring this down here. Like a lot of Christians, I grew up praying the beam me up, Scotty, prayer from the old Star Trek series. I thought that we were supposed to ask God to get us out of this messed up earth so that we could go to heaven. But Jesus taught a different prayer. Not get me out of here so that I can go up there, but make up there come down here. Make things down here run the way they do up there. Jesus' gospel is not about something that might happen sometime in the future. It has already began in him in hiddenness and sacrificial love, right in the midst of the kingdoms that oppose it. You may wonder, if the kingdom has come in Jesus, why is earth still a mess? Why are pain and suffering still with us? And the answer, which took the early church decades to come to grips with, is that the other kingdoms still remain. Other wills are opposed to God's will are still present. Thank God. Because one of those stubborn wills is mine. The story we tell at Christmas is that God so loved the world, that he so loved you, that he was never going to give up on you. No matter how far we've gone astray, no matter how much of a mess we've made of our life, no matter all the ways in which we looked at God's plan of what flourishing was and thought, nah, I'm going to choose my own way. No matter how many ways we've broken God's heart, God was going to continue to not separate himself from us and stay with us over and over and over again. But the message of Christmas is also 
that God was not going to give up on his plan. This world of flourishing, where things are going to get better and better and better, where we are remade into the image of God, that we get to work alongside him, resting and delighting, and that we get to be together with other people. That plan was just too good, and God was never going to keep talking about it, was never going to stop reminding us about it, was never going to stop inviting us into it, and was never going to stop even shining a big light so that we could see all of the ways that our lives are not that kingdom so that then he can come along and help us change so that he can bring his kingdom into our lives. Uh, let me read John 3.16 one more time. Uh, this is from the message version uh, of the Bible. It's just a different uh, version of the uh, how it's translated. It says, this is how much God loved the world. This is how God loved you. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed. The consequences of your sin don't have to keep destroying your life. You can change. And your life now and your eternity can be different. By believing, by trusting, by putting our trust back in his original plan, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. You can flourish. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son just to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. That's not who God is. He came to help. He came to put the world right again. This is the crisis that we're in. God light has streamed into the world. God has made his plan clear. But men and women, me, you, everywhere, we run for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. I think this might be a better way for me to actually flourish. And everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, they, they hate God light and they won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality, God light, so the work can be seen for the work, for the God work that it is. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Jesus. scary as it might be, I ask that you shine a light, your light on my life. I pray that you shine a light into each of our lives. I pray that you reveal all the ways that we have gone the wrong way sin and destruction in our life. But God, help us to know as we're going through that potentially awkward, humiliating, scary in some ways process of being revealed, of being exposed, for us to know who is doing it and why. That you want to expose the things in our life that are not a part of your original plan. Because you love us. And you know that the plan that we are choosing on our own, it's just not going to really help us ever flourish. It's going to keep us in these revolving cycles of just destruction of our relationship 
uh, of our hearts, of our minds. It's going to, as we talked about in the garden a few weeks ago, it's going to be choices that ultimately lead to death. But you are offering us a new way to live, an eternal way to live. And on top of all that, you've said that the things that we have done in rebellion, in sin, that you love us enough that you want to forgive those things at no cost to us and all cost to you. Because that's who you are. We love you. Amen.